Hello, and welcome to part four of our lecture series on the integumentary system. And part four, we're going to take a look at integumentary appendages, or basically specialized structures associated with the skin. Now, most of the appendages, most of these specialized structures that we're going to be talking about are going to develop from a downgrowth of epidermal cells. And so this is similar to what we saw with the establishment of glands when we talked about the epithelial lecture um, many lectures ago. So in essence, what we're going to have is epithelial cells along the epidermis, along the external surface, and they're going to respond to some type of signal from the dermal cells, the connective tissue cells underlying it. And they're basically going to start to grow down into the epidermis, but remain contact with, remain a connection with those lining cells of the epidermis. And so in this diagram, we're looking at some of the factors involved with production of a hair follicle. But in essence, we've got the flat epidermis responding to the dermal cells. The cells are going to divide. They're going to push down into the dermis. They're going to continue to divide and establish that three-dimensional structure. But if we take a look at it, it still is coherent and continuous with the epithelial lining. They're still continuous with the epidermis, and they're derived from these epidermal cells. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that even though they're derived from epidermal cells, we need to have that dermal signal, and we need to have signals coming from the connective tissue region, the dermis, uh, in order for these uh, structures to remain functional. Now, the first one we're going to look at are going to be hair. Um, and there are going to be two basic types of hair. Uh, there's vellus hair. Uh, we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, vellus hair is going to be relatively thin, relatively short, and very poorly pigmented. And so that's the type of hair which is going to be found over most of an individual's body. In contrast, instead of vellus hair, we've got terminal hair. Terminal hair is going to be much thicker, much longer, and more heavily pigmented. And so the, the hair on top of your head is going to be an example of terminal hair. Now, the important thing to recognize is that the type of hair that a follicle can produce, the structure that's going to be producing the hair, uh, can change over time. And so you can take a, a look at um, like your armpits in essence. And what happens is the follicles within the armpits are going to change from vellus hair to terminal hair at puberty. Uh, in male pattern baldness, uh, you can look at an individual that has a terminal hair being produced uh, up until a point, and then they start producing vellus hair. And so the nice, instead of the nice thick hair, they're going to be producing a relatively thin, short, po poorly pigmented hair. It'll kind of look like there's no hair there in essence. We take a look at the hair itself. Again, recognize that hair follicle is this structure continuous with the epidermis that is going to be involved with the production of hair. Uh, production of the, the hair is going to be a hair shaft is going to be a specialized epidermal structure. It's going to be packed with keratin, uh, the hard form of keratin, more harder form of keratin that would be found normally on the skin. Now under most circumstances we're going to have an individual hair follicle going through a pattern or a cycle uh, where it's sometimes producing hair and then sometimes it's going through a rest phase. And so antigen is going to be a period of active growth, of actively producing hair that terminal hair. Now, after about three years, that hair follicle is going to drop out of antigen and go through uh, essentially rest phases, catagen and telogen. Uh, we're not going to talk about the difference between those two phases uh, in, in this lecture, but it basically it's going to cause a reversion of the hair follicle for a little bit of time, almost like a resting stage, and then it's going to be stimulated again. And when it becomes stimulated again, it's going to go into the antigen phase and start to produce again that nice long hair shaft. Now the important thing to recognize is that there's a mosaic pattern with an individual so that not all of the hairs are going to be going through this resting, hair follicles are going to be going through this resting phase at the same time. So you're not going to lose all of your hair at once and then it's going to grow back three months later. Uh, it's that you're continuously losing some of the hairs, um, but you've got a majority of the other uh, hair follicles that are remaining in the antigen phase. We take a look at the hair follicle itself. Again, look at this uh, in much greater detail. Again, recognize that what we're dealing with is going to be a structure that's continuous with the epidermis. 
And so because of that, we're going to see the same type of arrangement that we would see between the epidermis and the dermis. And so the, the books and the diagrams are going to talk about the glassy membrane. The glassy membrane is going to be a thickened basement membrane. Again, that boundary between the epidermis and the dermis, the boundary between the epithelia and the underlying connective tissue. We're going to have an external root sheath, which is going to be a specialized region sitting upon our glassy membrane that's going to be involved in the production of our hair shaft. But if we were to trace that all the way up, we're going to see that it's continuous with the dermis. If we go down to the very base of this hair follicle, we're going to see a hair bulb. And what we're going to see is a region where we're going to have a dermal papillae, essentially a connective tissue component, that's going to look like that papillary layer of the dermis that was underlying our normal epidermis, our normal surface of the skin. And it's going to be important because this hair bulb, hair bulb is functioning because of that interaction between the dermal papillae and matrix cells, dividing cells, uh, almost like those stem cells that we talked about within the stratum basale uh, before, uh, when we're talking about the epidermis. Uh, if we take a look at the overall structure of the hair follicle, we'll see a sebaceous gland, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, normally associated with uh, hair shafts. Now again, keep in mind that the hair bulb is going to be this extension from the epithelial lining, from the epidermis, going all the way down and essentially engulfing or partially surrounding a dermal papillae. And that dermal papillae is going to be important because if we damage it, that hair bulb is going to stop functioning and that hair follicle is going to stop producing hair. Again, those cells within uh, the hair bulb are going to be dividing, differentiating or dividing, producing cells. Those cells are going to differentiate into that shaft of hair. Okay, so during that antigen phase, what we're going to see is the matrix cells are dividing, again, continuous with that epidermal lining, and they're going to be pushing cells up into this hair shaft. And as they become pushed up into the hair shaft, they're going to differentiate some of the way that the cells within the epidermis differentiated. And they're going to become either softly keratinized or moderately keratinized, in essence, with hard keratin, or heavily, heavily, heavily keratinized with this hard form of keratin. And in they're doing that, if they're at the center, they're going to be at the medulla or the outside, they're going to be maximally keratinized, heavily keratinized, very, very hard form of keratin in the cortex and the cuticle. So you've got that outer kind of rigid um, shaft around the hair, uh, the hair shaft as it's coming up. Now, if we take a look at hair color, or at least natural hair color, uh, what we're going to see is it's going to be determined by pigment similar to what we saw with uh, the pigment and the coloring of the skin. Now with hair, what we're going to be looking at is eumelanin, like the melanin we talked about with the skin, giving us a dark brown appearance, or pheomelanin, which is a reddish form of melanin because there's more cysteine present. And so you can look at the relationship between those, or at least the absence of those, uh, contributing to normal hair color. Now that's a, a hair shaft. We can take a look at uh, a fingernail or a toenail, and it's basically the same type of thing. We're going to have a nail matrix, we're going to have a nail bulb in essence, and instead of forming uh, a round shaft of hard keratin, remnants of these cells, what we're going to end up with is going to be a plate. And so we're going to end up with uh, a plate of cells, a very, very hard, much harder form than what we've got with the hair, but it's again going through that same process of differentiation with epithelial cells, with these epidermal cells being pushed up into what would now be the plate as opposed to into the hair shaft or pushed up into the higher layer levels within the epidermis. Now, associated with uh, the hair follicle is going to be a sebaceous gland in many circumstances. The sebaceous gland is going to be an example of an exocrine gland. It's associated with the hair follicle, and it's going to be undergoing a holocrine motor secretion. And so if we remember from many lectures ago, when we talked about the different modes of secretion, in the holocrine motor secretion, essentially the entire cell becomes a secretory product. And so in this, towards the base of the gland, you can see cells with no nuclei that look relatively normal. These are going to be stem cells. They're going to continue to divide to produce more cells that are going to be pushed up into the sebaceous gland. But as the cells get higher and higher within this gland, as they get closer and closer to the hair follicle, you're going to be becoming these cells enlarge. They're going to start to accumulate liquid. They're going to start to accumulate their secretory product. And their nuclei are going to start to condense down 
a term that's going to be called a pycnotic. Uh, essentially, they're going to become condensed down, they're going to become fragmented, and the nuclei are going to disappear because these cells are going to be going through a process of programmed cell death. And so basically what we're looking at is that with this holocrine mode of secretion, this cell is going to go through a process of terminal differentiation to become differentiated into that secretory product. Now sebaceous glands don't have an innervation, and so the secretion is going to be based on hormonal stimulation. If you look at the secretory product, sebaceous glands are going to be involved with the production of sebum, which is a relatively oily substance that's going to be found coating the hair and coating in the surface of the skin. Now it's thought that the sebum has some either antibacterial or antifungal effects, again, to coat the surface of the skin to minimize the risk of a harmful agent becoming established on the skin and potentially then getting into the body and causing a disease state. Now, changes in hormonal levels can cause increased production of the sebaceous cells, increased production of the sebum, and if we disrupt the, the release of the sebum from the sebaceous gland, it can give rise to something like acne. Now, the next type of structure we're going to take a look at are going to be the eccrine sweat glands. And again, keep in mind that these are cells that grow out from a, a, a down pocketing or, or such a growth of epithelial cells into uh, the dermis, and so the epithelial cells are going to extend down. They're going to remain in contact with the surface cells. So you trace these secretory regions, trace the duct regions, they're all going to end up with the epidermis. They're all going to end up on the surface of the skin. So eccrine sweat glands are going to be a tubular exocrine gland. We're going to have dark cells within the secretory portion, and again, these are identified with electron microscopy. They're going to be secreting glycoproteins. You're going to have some clear cells. They're pumping ions to modify the secretory product, modify the sweat, and then a few myoepithelial cells around there as well. And myoepithelial cells are going to be essentially epithelial cells with some contractile filaments, so with some uh, muscle-like characteristics that allow them to contract and help propel uh, the, the secretory product a little bit within the duct system. Now, the ducts within an eccrine sweat gland uh, are normally going to be simple or maybe stratified cuboidal cells. Um, not a whole lot of the, the stratified cuboidal cells, uh, but they're going to be characterized by the fact that they're going to have a relatively small lumen in relationship to the thickness of the cells uh, in the wall surrounding them. Eccrine sweat glands are going to be innervated by postganglionic, uh, sympathetic, or cholinergic uh, innervation. Now, eccrine sweat glands are going to be found in most regions of the skin, essentially all regions of the skin except for the lips and portions of the external genitalia. They're not associated with hair follicles. We get the sebaceous glands for that. Uh, and the eccrine sweat glands are going to be most numerous on uh, areas of the thick skin. So the palms, the hand, and the soles of the feet. The eccrine sweat glands are going to be involved with producing a, a watery solution, which can be relatively low in protein. Uh, it's going to have a variety of byproducts of protein metabolism. So urea, uric acid, ammonia, things like that, uh, can be released uh, in eccrine sweat. And the primary purpose of eccrine sweat is to regulate body temperature. And so you're essentially coating the body with a fluid, and as that fluid evaporates, it's going to pull the heat away from it. Now, the second type of sweat glands are going to be the apocrine sweat glands. Apocrine sweat glands are, again, another tubular exocrine gland. These are going to be emptying normally into a hair follicle, uh, and they become functional at puberty. Uh, these are going to have a very, very wide lumen, and so the diameter of the lumen is going to be very large in relationship to the thickness of the cells or the, the, the height of the cells that are surrounding it. Again, these cells are going to be lined by, or these uh, apricot sweat glands are going to be lined by a simple uh, cuboidal epithelium. Now, apricot sweat glands are going to be releasing their secretory product in response to emotional stimuli. Apricot sweat glands can be found in a variety of locations within the body, such as the axilla, the armpits, the areola, the nipple, perianal regions, external genitalia, and they're going to be releasing a glycoprotein, ammonia, and lipids in a proteinaceous milky fluid. Uh, so it, it's thought that they may have uh, the ability to produce uh, pheromones associated with this. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.